it will probably sound arrogant for me to describe it, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's later than we think. In The Hitchhiker's Guide, <clears throat> the Earth is actually a sophisticated computer designed to discover the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. And as you will recall, <coughs> the computer actually produced its result. The Earth did figure out what the meaning of life, the universe, and everything was in the form of a young woman on whom it dawned. I feel a little bit like I might be the young woman in that story. Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where an anthropologist and a psychologist listen to the greatest minds the world has to offer and we try to understand what they're talking about. I'm Matt Brown, with me is Chris Kavanagh, and today I am told we have a uh, medium-sized decoding. We're returning to some of our old favorites just because they've been delivering such beautiful content. Uh, tell us more, Chris. Okay, and for anybody who might not know, he's a psychologist I'm an anthropologist of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to clarify that I was a professor, but no, you went with the psychologist. That's fine. No, that too. He's a full professor. I'm an associate professor. That's important <laughs> uh, to clear as well. That's going to annoy that one guy. <laughs> yeah, so we cover gurus, we cover new gurus, we cover old gurus, and this time we've got two classic gurus uh, who have been on the rampage. And yeah. I think it is interesting to look at them because documenting the spiral of people is an interesting thing to do and these are two figures who have absolutely spiraled i mean we're never i don't think i would ever say they were good paradigms of careful speakers who were making well-researched points but it is fair to say that they weren't as overtly insane <laughs> as they as they now are um, and will hear. And that is one Brett Weinstein and one Jordan B. Peterson. Isn't he mm -hmm. B. Peterson? Yeah, he is B. Peterson. They have spiraled, but they never stopped delivering amazing content. So I guess there's a silver lining to every cloud. And to us... Like if we were a band, Chris, they would be our Take Me Home, Country Road, and Hotel California. You know, we can trot out the old hits anytime we <laughs> yeah. want. And there's some some good content there. But, you know, Chris, as you said, this is not just for entertainment purposes. This is serious stuff. Um, we need to monitor what's going on. That's right. So let's deal with the Weinstein brother first. So the main clips that we're going to play are from Brett appearing with Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is now on X, right? That's that's where he's, what's the word, Matt? He's emigrated to whatever. He got fired from Fox and he's relocated on X. So he, he uploads his, his little things there. The first clip that I'm going to play is not from his most recent appearance. It's from a slightly older one. Humanity is depending on everybody who has a position from which to see what is taking place, to grapple with what it might mean, to describe it so that the public understands where their interests are. It is depending on us to do what needs to be done if we're to have a chance of delivering a, a planet to our children and our grandchildren that is worthy of them, if we're going to deliver a system that allows them to live meaningful, healthy lives, we have to speak up. And I don't know, I don't know how to get people to do that. I, I'm very hesitant to urge others to put themselves or their families in danger. And I know that everybody's circumstances are different. Some people are struggling just simply to feed a family and keep a roof over their heads. Those people obviously have a great deal less liberty uh, with respect to, to standing up and saying what needs to be said. But this is really, it's what we call in game theory, a collective action problem. So um, we, don't, we don't know what he's referring to there, but Not Brett yet. is most certainly referring to himself. I guess he's carrying the cross. He is one of those people who understand what's is going on and is the one that needs to step up. He wouldn't want to put 
ask anyone else to carry that cross because it's dangerous out there. It's a oh. huge burden. It's mm. a heavy burden. It's dangerous. And the interesting thing with the classical guru figures that we've covered is that it's so overt in a way, like the, the part that is impressive in a way with Brett is how sincere he sounds about this being a really serious issue that he's fought hard about you know he's coming at it with a heavy heart but he's got truths that the world needs to deal with it's such an earnest delivery and the stakes are so high it's the future of the planet that's at stake it's our children our grandchildren if we cannot stand up Mm. what will they inherit yeah he's very good at it like he never actually blatantly says there i am the one who understands what's going on I'm the one who's speaking out. I'm the one that everyone needs to listen to. And I'm almost Christ-like in in bearing this burden because, you know, it's so difficult. But that's the subtext of all. Oh, yeah, but, you know, I think you're giving him too much credit (laughs) because Brett doesn't deal that much in subtext anymore. I mean, his fans seem to believe that his self-aggrandizement is not at the surface, but it is. He very directly says... I mean, we played a clip with him a couple of episodes ago saying that he is the person, like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, has understood everything, the meaning of life, <laughs> and the most the most informed person in the universe. So, like, he's not above saying, I am one of those people who get everything right. Like, every day on Twitter, he's running around doing victory laps, saying, you know, when you're as right as I am, it's just amazing that, you know, more people don't pay attention to you. So, like, yeah. I get it. I get it. I think in little periods like this where he's going high, you know, he's talking in weighty tones about the future of humanity and making a better world for our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. I can see how that works on less cynical people. Right. It does. And I, I, I think actually this clip that we just played is the thing which people like to invoke as showing that he is humble and sincere and a good guy. And then he can go on to say stuff like this. So I call the force that we're up against Goliath, just so I I remember what the battle is. Oh, Goliath. (laughs) Goliath made a terrible mistake, and it made it most egregiously during COVID, which is it took all of the competent people took all of the courageous people and it shoved them out of the institutions where they were hanging on. And it created, in so doing, the dream team. Created every player you could possibly want on your team to fight some historic battle against a terrible evil. All of those people are now at least somewhat awake. They've now been picked on by the same enemy and yeah, all right, we're outgunned. It has a tremendous amount of power, but but we've got all of the people who know how to think. So I hate to say it, or maybe I like to say it, but I don't think it's a slam dunk, but I like our odds. I've never met a more fluent biologist, I have to say. <laughs> brave words there. Brave, yeah. brave words from a brave man. Brett is saying that, you know, just in case you didn't pick up on the, <laughs> the subtle message that him and his friends, no longer the IDW because they were not brave enough. His new anti-vax colleagues mm-hmm. are the most insightful, bravest, smartest people. In particular, anybody that has disgraced themselves or lost a job or whatever because of their polemical anti-vax rhetoric or whatever. These are the absolute dream team of intellectuals. So, you know, he's talking about people like Steve Kirsch, like Robert yeah. Malone, yeah. Like, uh, uh, Peter and, McCulloch, yeah, or Dell Bigtree, all these very, very well established anti vax loons. And they are loons. I mean, you know, Joe Rogan would be also here, Pierre Corey, all these kind of people who have repeatedly shown themselves to be incredibly credulous, absolutely incapable of looking at things critically. But Brett regards them as the dream team. You know, Tucker Carson 
is included there, right? And again, the stakes could not be higher. It's a terrible evil. It's a historic battle. It's good against bad. It's black against white, the dark against the light. Yeah, David and Goliath. And David does beat Goliath in a, a feat of extraordinary courage and skill. So it's it's epic, yeah. It's an epic story in which um he places himself. I mean, it is it is good rhetoric. I know it it just seems so blatant if if you're familiar with him like we are, but he stops short of saying I am the one, you know, follow me. I can see further. Like personally, he he's careful to describe it as a small group of which he is most definitely a part of, but he does little things like that to make it just less less obviously self-aggrandizing. Well, constantly presenting himself as the underdog, you know, we're outgunned. There's a tremendous amount of power, but, you know, like the the plucky rebel alliance is Mm. the image that he likes to conjure up. You know, while he's talking to somebody who has a huge audience and platform because for, I guess, over a decade was one of the highest paid, most influential pundits on Fox News, like a, a mm-hmm. polemical right-wing outlet. But it, it doesn't matter, you know, like there's no amount of attention that will satisfy people like Brett or, or Tucker. They can be sitting with the richest man in the world, um, one of the highest paid media pundits, all with these people being given, you know, time and attention from right-wing politicians, and they'll all be sitting around saying how how terrible the elites are, <laughs> and the, you know, yeah. like the, the institutions are are really to blame, ignoring that they are in a media ecosystem which pumps them up and promotes them and all these things. But yeah, it it does feel incredibly transparent to me. You know, that this things the barometer on creating this this kind of epic story of you and the the other people that support you as you know freedom fighters that are important to the world but also just to note that that often happens in these communities it actually also uh, famously happens in left-wing um activism spaces as well because brett invoked a dream team and appeared to be insinuating that he is amongst them, right? And obviously the people that he likes. A bunch of conspiracy, more hardcore anti-vaccine people were annoyed at this because they were like, you're Johnny come lately. You weren't properly scared at the vaccines at the start. And, you know, you're not dismissive enough of vaccines now. So, you you know, you're not the dream team. You're just a, what's the word, like, Johnny come lately. Uh, yeah, these these extremist kind of um, and, and conspiratorially minded groups are famously fractious. And it's been a little bit fun to see Brett dealing with the little world that he's made for himself, dealing with like conspiracy theorists and crackpots who are his audience now, many of whom are crazier than him. For instance, believe that it's uh, all a plot from the Jews specifically, or that COVID was not actually a disease. It didn't actually exist at all. The apparent um, disease was caused by persistent inflammation from maybe chemicals being sprayed by the government or something. Like These are the people that he's now engaging with on social media. And you know, I, I, I derive a small amount of joy from that. Forgive me for doing so, but yeah. Though I don't think it really seems to impact him because, you know, like, I mean, it impacts him because he complains about it, but it, in all cases, he's just constantly presenting himself as, you know, that he was more ahead of the curve than people realize. So it's, it is funny to see because he essentially has to argue that he was much more like Brett Weinstein is a huge anti-vaxxer now. Massive. It's very transparent. So if he's not anti-vaxxing enough for you, you are like, you know, at the insane wing. But for Brett to derive credit from there, he has to say, I'm more anti-vaxxing than you ever imagined. Like, if you look carefully, I was hugely anti-vaxxing, you know, way back when. But, you know, they don't say that because none of them are anti-vaxxing. But he will point out things that he said, which can be interpreted as stronger or whatever. But that's the point is that a lot of his followers back at that stage would have been arguing the ambiguity that he inserted was because he's not anti-vaccine, right? So like now, if you were somebody that cared about consistency and you had spent a bunch of time like defending Brett saying, you know, that he he isn't somebody who was, you know, that far 
gone. He is now saying, I was. I was much more anti-vaxxing than anybody appreciates. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to the people that follow him. It's good news, basically, because they're along for the ride. He's led a bunch of people down the same rabbit hole with him. So, yeah, any audience members that he's lost by being hugely anti-vaxxing, he has replaced with more hardcore conspiratorial types. Like he's he's up at Alex Jones level. Although I noticed that his Patreon numbers, maybe an index of his popularity, have been waning. Um, yes, there's a slow decrease, but you have to consider that they have a whole bunch of other revenue sources. Like Brett, every episode has about four or five advertisers. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not talking about... You know, he's poor now or anything. I'm just saying it's an index that there was a peak of anti-vax conspiracism, paranoia, et cetera, around COVID, understandably. That time has passed and um, it's now returning back to baseline levels of Maybe. I don't know, because like John Campbell seems to be going from strength to strength. I don't know. Maybe there's a you know, a specific analysis you could do to look at, like, I would imagine there is a peak, you know, when Brett was presenting about being demonetized on YouTube and all that, he, he did get a big burst of support. But I, I think now there's a high ceiling when it comes to support from conspiracists and anti-vaxxers, because I think that community got a real <laughs> shot in the arm, <laughs> if you will, from the, the COVID pandemic. So you know, RFK Jr., I'm sure, is riding high on donations. He's not going to get elected or anything like that, but I, he's definitely more relevant now than he's ever been mm -hmm. in the past, you know, like decade or whatever. So I'm just saying, Matt, I think you're optimistic if you view it that their influence will win. Mm -hmm. It may do. I would hope so. But Maybe so. Maybe so. All right. So play us another clip. Let's find out where he was going after this, yeah. this setup. So that was a while ago, and he had a more recent appearance on Tucker um, where he, he forwarded a new revolutionary theory <laughs> he's developed. I don't know if he developed it just in that moment or, you know, it's been swirling around, but it's quite impressive. He went to the border to kind of do an investigation for Tucker. That is the southern border of the United States, the border with Mexico. yeah. You need Brett Weinstein to go and work out, you know, what's going on with the migrant situation there. Obviously, he's the man for the job. So let's hear some of the thoughts that he had. And some of this is the, related to basically him seeing different groups of immigrants and how they reacted to him. Like if they were friendly and they wanted to talk to him or they were willing to talk to him, you know, he, he was kind of like, positive about them but in the case of chinese immigrants they didn't seem interested in talking to him and and this raised brett's suspicion so he developed some interesting theories out of these experiences i wrote an essay years ago about the one child policy and the paradox of a heavy bias in favor of males no matter how different males and females are in their maximum reproductive capacity they tend to default to one to one if you have a society that has too many females, you should produce a male. And if you have a society with too many males, you should produce a female, which tends to balance these things out. That logic should have applied to China. The fact is there were lots of excess males. And if you put yourself in the mindset of a Chinese person having a child, if there are too many males, you should want to produce a female. A male is very unlikely to find a mate. A female is certain to find one. And what's more, she has her pick of the litter. Yes. So that logic should have caused the sex ratio to return to 50-50, and yet it did not, which caused me all those years ago when I wrote this piece to wonder if there wasn't another evolutionary force in play. If evolution did not have a mechanism for producing armies, that when a, a country was in a position to expand that producing excess males does pay off at a lineage level that excess males who have no reproductive prospects at home become an effective weapon against neighboring populations so i can't believe that that did not occur to me as i was um, preparing for this trip but uh it has occurred to me now i guess it didn't occur to me because when i 
wrote that all those years ago, I was expecting to see evidence that this was turning into a military force and I didn't see it. So I stopped thinking about it. Um, but now I wonder if that isn't exactly right. And if what happened is that um, a male biased population in China was produced as a weapon. And if that weapon is now being deployed. That's remarkable. That is, that is remarkable. <laughs> We're going to have to resist the temptation to just respond in three words here, Chris, because that's my immediate inclination. But let's, as an exercise, let's follow through his logic there. His logic. Yeah. So um, in, in, in Brett's world, there, there are lineages, right? So the Chinese are a lineage and a, a lineage sort of has interests, some sort of group selection thing. And um, evolutionary biology can can explain things like China's one child policy, or in other parts of the world at different times at different places. Often, you know, there is a fair bit of misogyny. There is a there is a fair bit of patriarchy, and for various reasons, uh, people uh, in different cultures at different times have preferred to have a boy. Right, uh, the boy can provide for the parents, and yada yada yada. Um, so, so when China uh, in- introduced its one child policy, because the Chinese Communist Party was concerned about overpopulation. The effect, especially in the countryside, led to a somewhat of a preponderance of boys being around, but not because women were biologically just having more boys, right? There is there is no way that could possibly happen. Rather, just through various mechanisms, whether or not there was some sort of abortions or even abandoning children or not looking after them as well as they could be. And if, if they're a girl, there's probably a variety of unpleasant things there. Uh, has led to a small, a relatively small, I mean, in statistical terms. What what was the number? We're just looking at a graph there. What, what did it peak at? It peaked at 117 in around 2005 to yeah. 100. 117 boys to 100 girls. And and it's now 111. This is according to our world in data. There's different measurements, right? There's a whole bunch, but the one that we saw, which seems yeah. reliable, and, and the rate now is down to 111.8, um, yeah. if you want to be specific. And the baseline, by the way, is about 105 for various reasons. We don't need to get into biological reasons. It's so not Brett ex- is wrong when he says it's it's always one for one. Yeah. First of all, it, it, it isn't, but, you know, close to. Yeah, the, the general point that he was alluding to is that, you know, because sexual reproduction is an inherently symmetrical exercise that in general, theoretically, you're going to expect to see a, a one-to-one uh, ratio. But where he goes really bonkers is thinking that this is a strategy. This is a lineage level strategy deployed by sort of Chinese people at like as a gestalt or something like that to sort of deliberately- as a yeah. as a lineage to have more boys so that they can create an army. And, and first of all, this doesn't actually create more boys, right? All it does, it actually reduces the number of girls. But anyway, that aside. <laughs> so Brett has, like, a, as we've covered many times, he has a hyper-adaptionist perspective. But it, it even doing that is slightly unfair to bad evolutionary biologists. Like Brett's form of evolutionary biology is just purely in his head. Like he... He recognizes something that exists, and if it exists in the world, it is essentially an adaptation. Yeah. If he thinks it is, that's that's it. It sounds like I'm straw manning his process, but that is literally it. And if there's something that he doesn't like that he sees in the world, then it's like kind of counter to adaptive processes or whatever. Or maybe it is a negative lineage thing like in this case so the whole point is everything that brett sees in the world he talks about seeing things through an evolutionary lens but it essentially just means that he can make up endless amount of just those stories we saw before that he talked about post-mortem ejaculation which again is is also not a a thing but he talked about it being like a last ditch adaptation for you know males who are being executed on to, to like potentially spread the seed it's just it's so so stupid but it, he seriously suggested it and here he is suggesting like another extremely silly thing because okay the chinese one child policy is something that emerged because something in the environment 
signal to the Chinese lineage, which again, let's not really think about what a lineage is. Let's just assume that he's right, that the lineage picked up that the environment requires, you know, like an ant colony. It needs to defend, so it's got to produce more warrior cast people, more meals. So through whatever, again, the mechanisms are fuzzy, (laughs) it led to the Chinese Communist Party instigating a a policy that restricted the number of children. Now, you might think, Matt, there, one logical thing would, wouldn't they want to increase the amount of meals? So, like, you could... Yeah, have yeah. A Would, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they want more children, not just one? Yeah, sure. You could be meal biased, right? But then, why did they restrict it to one if they need a a big army to invade? But you know, there's complex interactions. <laughs> Maybe it's that the lineage worked out that the environment could only handle Support. a certain mm. carrying mm. capacity. So yeah, so through an evolutionary mechanism, perhaps influencing the minds of Chinese people and the ones that got into power expressed this instinct that they need to instantiate a one-child policy, right? You know, it could have been a whole bunch of different ways that they did it. This is the way that they did it. And now they have built up a, a meal army and that army has been has been sent by the lineage through perhaps through the communist party or maybe not maybe through some gestalt understanding to mexico is that right to, well, in, in order to cross the border <laughs> into the united states presumably they're just sending them like everywhere you know china is forging alliances across africa and so on as well and but but they're an army like they're, they're warriors right they're not just men so they're they're going overseas in order to, I assume, do some kind of fifth column uh, or stage some sort of insurrection, the, a Chinese insurrection in the United States or something. I'm just following following the logic here. Well, maybe let, let's let let him detail a bit more so that you can follow where he's going with this. So, you know, we've established that the Chinese are attempting to send an army which the lineage have created to the U.S., simply via the southern border with Mexico. Now, why are they doing that? You know, because they're not doing direct conquest. That would be too obvious. The lineage knows that. Um, so what's what's up? People who get more than three of these shots have an interesting effect that uh, none of us saw coming, which is the triggering of something called IgG4. The fact that these shots seem to trigger the production of IgG4 is fascinating. It could just be uh, an unexpected consequence that nobody saw coming. But if you think about what it is that the folks who try to produce biological weapons want, they want a weapon that um, separates populations. The message that was injected into so many people was like a firmware update. It was a firmware update that caused the immune systems of those people to take up a new way of viewing the world. And that new way of viewing the world seems to have produced this attenuation signal uh, in response to the antigen, the spike protein antigen. So am I seeing a mirage? Let's hope so. So just to try to f- flesh out or put in non-specialist terms what you may be suggesting, it's plausible that this was all an effort to make one population effectively immune from some new bioweapon and another population susceptible to it? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that is what I'm saying. And again, all it is is possible. I don't know who's who on this playing field, and I don't know what they want, but to the extent that there seemed to be an absolute obsession with injecting absolutely everybody with these so-called vaccines, that was conspicuous. That did not seem like uh, just greed and a desire to sell more shots. I agree completely. He's seeing evidence through this IgG4 thing or whatever that the vaccines actually in some populations, maybe European ones, uh, you know, Caucasian 
populations actually reduces their resistance to viruses like COVID and actually divides people or it's a firmware update or something. I didn't quite understand that. The general thing is there's there's like a new anti-vax thing, which is IgG for antibodies claiming to be a high following mRNA vaccination. And Brett, and others are saying that because the vaccines have been administered, you know, in the US and mRNA vaccines have not been administered across China, that mm. we have potentially not only not vaccinated against COVID, but we've weakened the immune system of everybody who's been vaccinated. And it's worse for the people who have been repeatedly vaccinated. Right. So he doesn't know who's behind this, but it seems to be something that's operating in the interests of China. And it's related to their sending an army to the United States because Chinese people, for interesting reasons, haven't had access to the same mRNA Western developed China vaccines. China wants to develop a domestic vaccine, yeah. yeah, which they, by the way, claim to have done yeah. and are you know in the process of starting to roll out. But they didn't administer all the same vaccines that were across the western world so isn't that suspicious what's going on there and it's it brett isn't saying that it's true he's just raising the possibility of have we mm. at the same time that the chinese lineage has been busy creating this you know super army of mm. of males the next step seems to be that we you know is it through the Chinese creating COVID or whatever the case might be? Mm. We have, you know, badly weakened our populations and they have not. Yeah. He doesn't, I mean, he's not saying that's true. He's just saying, what yeah. if that's true? Yeah. I particularly appreciated his um, coming to the conclusion that mere profiteering, giving these dangerous and unnecessary vaccinations just purely in order to for the you know, rich companies, biotech companies, whatever, to to make money. That is an insufficient explanation for for the rampant vaccination that's been going on globally. There could be something more to it. It's like connected mm -hmm. to the Chinese. Interesting, interesting stuff. Yeah. So you know, as as Tucker says, that's remarkable. Interesting, if true. Well, let's get to the the last bit of the plot. Doubtless, you have seen Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois' comments in the Senate, where he said, "Hey." we should let people who came here illegally join the U.S. military. What, what does that make you think? Well, this makes me think back to the COVID crisis and some thoughts that I was developing then about the insanity of throwing highly trained people in many cases out of the U.S. military for refusing to take the so-called vaccines. Now, my sense at the time was that that likely had the purpose of getting rid of the kinds of people who refuse yes. moral orders. That's right. And that it created a much more compliant force. Now, what happens if migrants are given citizenship in exchange for military service in the US military? That seems to create a major hazard because the perverse incentives for a migrant and the lack of allegiance to fundamental American values means that that would be just the kind of force that could be used to impose tyranny on other Americans because, yes. uh, because they would have, you know, no history with us that would cause them to think twice. We, we've seen this before with the Roman legions. Um, that's exactly my conclusion. Um, does that sound like a crazy conclusion? Uh, I think we have to stop punishing ourselves for considering things that once seemed crazy. That the pattern of recent <laughs> history. <laughs> I'm sorry, can I, I want to repeat that. I think we have to stop punishing ourselves for considering things that once seemed crazy. It's good that the Brett and Tucker have each other to keep themselves in check, right? Because, you know, if they were conspiracy prone fantasists with mm. right wing tendencies. They might end up, you know, agreeing on, on things that are unlikely to be true. But fortunately, they don't have that problem. They're both the part of the dream team, the sharpest minds that mm. we have. I feel like Tucker, like Tucker is an absolute 
grifter, an opportunist who I don't think believes three quarters of what he says. He's an absolute shit, but he's a, he's a, he's a cynic and a profiteer. And when I hear him giggling like that, I, I feel like there's I, a part of him that knows what that sounds like, right? Like, yeah, I, I, think so. I, I think there is, but I think he is also, as his emails about Trump revealed, like he's absolutely cynical. He's no problem completely lying about things that he knows aren't aren't true but i i don't think tucker is without his own you know firm no no, of course there's no dichotomy there it's no like oh tucker's a has perfectly normal opinions and he's just pretending no 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 but what it's not even that i mean just that like after he left fox right he's been on unleashed to a certain extent and it's just shown that when he isn't under editorial control. There is nothing to which he will not stoop. That is absolutely for sure. But Chris, the logic here is great. So it's very concerning that there is some kind of um, consideration for the idea that undocumented residents of the United States could join the US military and after putting in however many years of military service, that might earn them a path to citizenship. That's very concerning because it forms part of a pattern whereby people from the military who are good, honest, native-born Americans could be expelled from the military for reviews and the vac- vaccination. They're obviously the good ones, the ones that have a moral center and can think for themselves, and they're being replaced with a more compliant foreign army. A fifth column. Yeah. It's amazing how much Brett is able to link everything back to COVID and vaccines and, and stuff, right? Like, I mean, we saw this with the 7th of October attacks by Hamas, that he linked the subsequent discord in anti-vax communities because of that conflict to like a plot. I think he identified, so it, it was an Israeli intelligence failure, right? They did not see it coming and they- Which is impossible. Which could have been possible. So that was an indicator. And also Israel had vaccinated its population. They've put these two things together and you see that the Israeli government is actually in the pocket of Goliath. Goliath. What's the matter, Goliath? Yeah, to exterminate the Israeli people, yeah. You know, for Brett, the most salient thing is that it's causing him trouble in his little dream team communities. So that, therefore, has to be the the point of the plot, right? Like, it all revolves around him and his friends and this thing. And in this case, he's been sent to work out immigration crisis, what's going on there. And uh, he saw some Chinese people that didn't want to talk to him. And this is what is it resulted, <laughs> <laughs> right? He he's forged an incredible evolutionary theory about the one-child policy, and now he's linked that to his anti-vaccine theories to say that the Chinese and presumably other lineages, which are you know doing similar sorts of things, they are sending in little drones that are then being encouraged by the Democrats or the agents of Goliath, one and the same, really, to join the military. And they are compliant because of the, you know, the they want to get citizenship and stuff like that. And the brave, the dream team of soldiers, they got kicked out for refusing to go along with the totalitarian orders about vaccines. So now you have this terrifying situation where you have the only the compliant soldiers remaining and an ever increasing fifth column of yeah. immigrants from different lineages that are infecting the US military so they will not be hesitant to take on you know totalitarian orders now one step further from that might be to consider if you had a populist right wing leader who had shown authoritarian tendencies and a, a desire not to give up power that, that you might add that, right, to the, this conspiracy, that if we have made this supplicant army, that, you know, that would be a, a dangerous force. But, like, for Tucker and Brett, you know, they want Trump. Uh, or Trump is the, he's a, you know, a relative goodie compared to the bad guys, even if they don't like him personally. So it's not that. This is the army for China, Biden, Kamala Harris. According to Brett, Biden should already be dead. Like he, I believe he was supposed to die shortly after his inauguration, but certainly within his first, you know, term, he's not supposed to have seen that through. So oh, that's right. It was meant to just be a facade through which Kamala Harris could 
yeah you know, segue to, to the presidency but that didn't the cyanide must not have worked or something well uh, <laughs> it seems that biden has is too robust <laughs> he just he, he won't die or alternatively they've just jettisoned that and now they're like actually it's better because he can be you know the puppet that takes the blame mm, while yeah. kamala harris and the other agents of yeah. goliath are like the actual power goliath isn't afraid of your old dog are you goliath but, you know, Chris, I, mean, I haven't thought about Brett that much for a long time, but are you, like me, like almost impressed? Like his ability to make these disparate connections between his pet things, evolutionary, biology, crazy, mad um, evolutionary psychology and anti-vax Anti and the kind of conspiratorial WEF Goliath thing, he connects it all together. In a, in a yeah. way that is, it is impressive. It's impressive that he, <laughs> he goes like he constantly outdoes himself in how far right and insane his conspiracies are. Right, like this is really this is wild by Infowars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it, like it, Alex it, Alex Jones doesn't. What I'm saying is Alex Jones doesn't have the imagination to like craft these things the difference with alex jones is that i mean alex jones does but he just you know he just rrr, 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 he just says it in a very gravelly ranty way and throws in whatever but the thing with brett is he's saying absolute ludicrous things and they're bad shit the rest on like a complete lack of understanding of evolution, of politics, of yeah. of everything. He, yeah. Like he knows, yeah. he knows less than nothing. Yeah. He knows less than nothing. <laughs> but, and, but, the, but the way he delivers it, yeah. Yes, unlike Alex Jones, who you know at least conforms in most respects to the stereotypical presentation of an insane, you know, conspiracy theorist. He's mm. he's ranting and getting animated and all that kind of thing. Brett is at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of delivery. He's very considered. He's yep. almost saddened by yeah. the news mm. that he has to deliver. Yeah. Good people, Matt, you know, we're just noted. He doesn't want to talk about these ideas, but he can't stay silent because him and his mm. wife, they're the kind of people that stand up when bad things happen. Yep. And, you know, that's yep. it. Yep. And it's, but he's, <laughs> his conspiracy is just the same as Alex Jones' conspiracy and people have noticed this. Some people in the heterodox sphere, particularly those that stood against his anti-vaccine stance, have noticed this. But I, I do think that still there is a surprising amount that take Eric and Brett at least somewhat seriously, as if yeah, yeah, not treat them as mm. people that we should listen to their opinions about you know what's going on in Palestine and Israel or this kind of thing, and like. This should illustrate, at very least in the case of Brett, that there's absolutely no reason to listen to him on anything. If this is the quality of his thought, it should draw into question like any respect you have for him because he's referencing the areas that he claims expertise in to justify this position. And also, this will be forgotten. This is just, you know, Tuesday. He he doesn't need to return to this. He might reference it sometimes, but he he just is throwing out conspiracies like this constantly mm. these days. So yeah, yeah, he's he's a maniac, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a soft smoking maniac. But it, and the soft smoking sciency tone of delivery seems to throw off a whole bunch of people. Admittedly, yeah. it's mostly morons now, but, you know, <laughs> not entirely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is it is not different from what he was doing previously when we've covered him, but it is, I guess, the discrepancy between the lunatic ideas that are there and the tone and the, the delivery, which he's maintained and probably improved upon, you know, casually referring to the IGG4 and so on, as if he's one of the people whose minds are totally wrapped around this thing. It's all designed to create that impression that this is a scientist, this is an intellectual, this is a careful and considered person. And yeah, it's an amazing trick. I'm a little bit in awe of this because he's him and people like him, you know, there's a few others in our guru pantheon, but they've done what someone like Alex Jones can't, which is to put that veneer on utter batshit crazy. So uh, yeah, thanks for 
Thanks for bringing it to our attention, Chris. Is, are there any more clips from Brett or are we done? Uh, no, that's it for Brett. But just to mention as well, Matt, that he's managed to appear on Tucker twice and he previously appeared with Michael Shermer and said that, you know, no immuno- immunologist would be able to explain these problems he had about, you know, basic COVID vaccines stuff. And debunked the funk, Dan Wilson got four experts together to deliver you know, detailed rebuttals, which he, he he asked for specifically, and he hasn't produced any response to that. Right? They they highlighted how he was absolutely wrong in everything that he said, and that experts have addressed you know these issues multiple times, and Brett has completely ignored that because he's busy doing shit like this, right? So like like you say, like referencing the IgG four is just like somebody referencing Fimerasol. He's just picked it up from anti-vax. Twitter and whatever and like yeah but it it is a good pantomime he's good at pantomiming and he sells it to his audience one final thing before we leave Brett just want to shout out the bad stats I don't know about you Chris but certainly his his Twitter thread on Brett Weinstein and this content was the first time that I became aware of it Um, so thank you bad stats for gracefully letting us steal your content yes that is true so as always Thank you to Mr. Bad Stats. It's always nice to see an old friend, another old friend, someone that we have covered multiple times and crops up now and again with his takes, is one Jordan Peterson. Now, as we've covered, Jordan Peterson has over time spiraled as well. He always was narcissistic, grandiose, and prone to flights of interpretive fancy, but He's become increasingly polemical, increasingly unhinged, more overtly partisan, so on and so forth. And, you know, we, we've covered some of the speeches he gave. Remember when he came back and once upon a time he was saying he doesn't know enough about the vaccines to comment, but he's certainly beyond that now. So one thing that's happened to him recently is that the licensing board for his clinical psychology qualification received complaints about his conduct, right? And this was mainly his conduct on social media, on Twitter, but also on podcast appearances and whatnot. And various people complained and then the the licensing body agreed that there appeared to be a case for his social media activity to not be befitting that of a... Uh, you know, one of their members. So they gave him a slap on the wrist. Of course, you know, he he appealed their judgment and all that kind of thing. But basically they said, you need to go to a training course about how to use social media responsibly. So Jordan Peterson probably (laughs) took them to court, claiming that they don't have the right to send him to a training course. It's against his free speech. A court confirmed that they do have the right (laughs) So as a licensing body. So Jordan Peterson appealed that. And his appeal was rejected, you know, on similar grounds. So he's now twice lost at court saying that they they don't have the right to discipline him in this way because it's, you know, infringing his political speech. And so now he made a podcast talking to Michaela about this judgment, this recent, you know, failure to successfully appeal that the licensing body doesn't have the right to send him on this course. And... I mean, so it's basically if he wants to keep his license, he has to do a, you know, use social media responsibly course. And this is him talking about that situation. You know, you asked me how I'm doing. It's like this didn't really come as a surprise. So I'd already prepared for it. Um, And as you and I spoke about last night and I've talked over with Tammy, too, and with Julian, my son, for, you know, to some degree. We're going to see what good we can make arise from this. And if this is my opportunity to further expose the machinations of the radical left, narcissistic, resentful, woke mob, then bring it on, boys. We saw what happened to Claudine Gay. We saw what happened to the president of UPenn. If the good people at the Ontario College of Psychologists think they're immune from such things, they have another thing coming. So, okay. So that's Jordan throwing down. Bring it on. Just one point I'd note here is that they often reference, you know, they've checked with the people they trust, their family, 
and the family have said, all right, you do what you got to do, right? It's like the same thing as when Brett says, I checked with Heller and Eric and they both, you know, confirmed or whatever. Like they've got this network of people that they, you know, like when in, in many respects, it's a reasonable thing for someone to say, I'm going to do something that is disruptive of my family's life or whatever. So I'm going to check in with them. But it, it always strikes me that like when Jordan Peterson and or Brett or whatever talk about the, you know, the way that they check themselves, they're checking with people that are hugely biased towards them and invested in seeing things from their perspective, right? It's always like their wife and family members or people that are very ideologically predisposed to agree with them. So Hmm. yeah, anyway, they agreed that he should do what he wants to do. So he's going to do what he wants to do. And, you know, if they didn't think they're in for a fight, they have another thing coming. Yeah. Like Jordan hasn't actually, as far as anyone knows, hasn't undertaken any clinical counseling for many years. Am I wrong? No. I mean, he was in a coma and uh, unable to even podcast for a, a year or, or I mean, he wasn't in a coma for a year, but he was recovering. Yeah. So, so, so I guess my point here is that, I mean, he quit his academic job. He no longer does clinical counseling, hasn't done for a very long time. He's a full-time author, pundit, entrepreneur, maker of videos, etc. public figure. This court case, everything. Is, is fundamentally, it's like a culture war thing, right? It's like a media kerfuffle that if I was in his shoes and I was totally focused on what generates more attention and more drama, how can I project myself into the role of the, of the a, a little bit like Brett there, David fighting Goliath, then, you know, this is, this is a, a nice little opportunity. He's never one to turn down the chance to crusade. So this is Jordan jumping on a new crusade and whether you're a fan or a critic, this is something that he does. He goes on tirades and crusades, which he regards as being because he's a very principled person. And, you know, if he won't stand up for things, bloody hell, who will, Matt? So you mentioned that, you know, but it, it, it's not really a huge threat for him to have his license removed. And he does make that point. You know, and maybe I'm wrong. I'm not wrong about the damn tweets. You know, I might be wrong about how this is going to unfold, but even there, the worst thing they can do to me is take my license. Now, they're definitely planning to do that because the rule is I have to be educated by people of their choice at my expense for whatever length of time they deem suitable until by their standards, I've learned whatever the hell lesson I'm supposed to learn. And I can't even imagine what that lesson would be. It's like, what, don't tweet, don't speak, don't think? Don't tell my clients the truth. So I don't know how to learn that lesson. I don't know how they're going to measure whether or not I've learned it. I don't know who they're going to get to measure it. I have no idea who they're going to get to teach me. I guess we're going to find out. I would like to find out. I'm very curious about that person. And uh, so I'm set up for failure. And, you know, my detractors will say, well, Dr. Peterson, you say yourself up for failure. You know, whatever. But, um, well... I don't think I've set myself up for failure. I wouldn't say the evidence so far suggests that I have. There's quite a lot there. (laughs) There's the bit at the start where he mentions that the worst thing is them possibly taking his license and how that's not really bad anyway. And Matt, they're going to put him on this training course and who knows when that can end or what it will entail. And like, then he lets his imagination run wild where it's like what are they gonna say like don't speak don't don't say anything don't talk and like no jordan they're going to tell you to stop tweeting like a demented muppet (laughs) like they're gonna tell you if you want to be you know a licensed psychologist you can't just be running rampant unleashing your you know your id all over the internet that's what they're gonna tell you it's a very straightforward like it would be an absolutely bog standard thing but he seems to work himself up into this tizzy that he's going to be like, you know, clockwork orange, have his Mm. eyes taped open for, for who knows, five years, Matt, in a fucking, you know, Canadian, Siberian style prison. Like a a, a re-education camp. Yeah. Yeah. Because he does tweet madly, right? Like, regardless of what you think of Jordan Peterson, he does tweet in a pretty demented way. And, you know, I can understand that even a, a, a board that probably doesn't want anything to do with this. Um, there are very strong free speech 
protections in North America. And like you said, it would be some sort of just by the numbers little thing. Look, please, please don't call someone a whatever, a raging fat hag or something like that. That isn't appropriate yeah. for a thing. And <laughs> yeah, and, and then he does that little voice, which is like, oh, yeah, like, that was- like he was he was imagining some some hypothetical critic. Detractor. Yeah, detractor. Yeah. But that that isn't like the the words that he was putting into the 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 detractor's voice there w- was not something that ever occurred to me. That's just stuff that would occur to Jordan, right? Well, no, the one about, you know, that these you've set yourself up for failure, right? Like <laughs> that, that, I mean, he is doing that. I would say that. I, mean, I would probably wouldn't use that tone of voice, but like he he is setting it up so that he cannot do the training course, right? Like he, he could have just went, because he's like, you know, who, who knows how long it could be. I can tell him it could probably be a maximum like eight weeks or, you know, a couple of months. Uh, like training courses don't tend to last indefinitely when they're, you know, like a, a kind of punishment thing, right? So, yeah, it, it would be a set amount of time and it would be extremely boring probably, but by him setting it up that it's this big thing and that he's going to rage against it and that he's going to fight it at every step of the way, he is essentially making it so it's almost impossible for, you know, just him to comply with some bog standard training course because he's going to make it into Hmm. a huge deal no matter what it is. (laughs) Well, yeah, of course. It's clearly like a rehash of the original thing that helped propel him to fame. Yeah, where he took his principled stand against, what was it? Something C-16. In the, C-16, C-16. C-16. You know, like whether he's right or wrong, or, like whatever you think of that issue, he was definitely beating it up in order to make it a drama with him at the center of it. This seems to be now his modus operandi. Yes, let's hear him go on a little bit more about um, potential consequences that could happen from losing his license. It's okay. Now, what's the consequence of me losing my license? Well, it's annoying, you know, because those are hard licenses to get. And I worked very hard to earn and deserve that license and to maintain it. And also very hard at being a good therapist, which I was. There were no complaints taken about against me by anyone until I became known in the public sphere, you know, so that's a good thing to consider. And I'm not that happy about the prospect of the woke Beatles that you described having their way with my professional credentials. It annoys me deeply. Now, on the other hand, I'm not dependent on that license anymore. I have other tricks up my sleeve, so to speak, anyways. And at some point, I'm going to determine that being a member of their pathetic little incestuous, ideologically addled, resentment-ridden, bureaucratic, pea-brained, micro-souled club is not worth the effort. And I suppose we're probably there already, but I have something to do publicly, you know, in my delusion. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess he's acknowledging that they're probably, he's probably going to lose this fight against Goliath. Stop him, Goliath! But, you know, he doesn't care. He says tricks up his sleeve. What he means is very large, significant sources of income such that it really doesn't matter very much whether he practices or not. Yeah, though, it does strike me as a something of an internal battle that you can hear, like, bits of it flashing up there. Because at the start, you know, he's like, well, you know, he likes one of these things that Jordan likes to do is pose himself hypothetical questions and then answer them himself right and he's like so what are the consequences well it's annoying you know and then he's saying and these licenses are hard and i worked hard to get it and i'm a good i was a good therapist and blah 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 and that annoys me then though he kind of shifts to and then anyway i've got all the tricks and do i want to be a member of your little pathetic incestuous ideologically adult you know bureaucratic pea brain micro soul club like this is him into the Jordan Peterson, the polemicist, you know, the the pundit kind of character. If you were a professional of of some variety and your licensing board was taking disciplinary action against you and you went on a public broadcast 
and referred to the members of the board as pathetic, incestuous, ideologically addled, resentment-ridden, bureaucratic, pea-brained, micro-sold individuals. That wouldn't show that you are a particularly responsible member of the of the community, right? Uh, like, or that you're concerned about remaining in good standing. Like, hmm. he isn't. But he, these, and this is the kind of thing that he does all the time. Even worse on Twitter. I can remember him talking about his own university, who didn't fire him and treated him pretty well. I thought, but he described it in like the worst possible terms, like constantly attacking it you know using the same kind of language almost wanting them to do something to him to sort of justify this but it's this i mean like i have a lot of discussions with people online chris about you know sort of free speech and stuff like that and there will be people who who feel very strongly about free speech and i can understand why they do it's it's an important thing who would be sort of on jordan peterson's side saying some professional organization shouldn't be monitoring your your tweets and things like that and telling you what you can say and what you can't say. And I I have some sympathy for that point of view. Like I don't want my vice chancellor, you know, checking my tweets and then sending me an email if I'm if if he thinks that I'm giving incorrect opinions or something, right? I agree with that, right? But at some point it becomes a bit mad, doesn't it? Where you have some kind of professional organization or a social group or a parents and teachers organization or you've got a job with a you know a company or a university and you're spending all your time just saying what pathetic little shits they are and how you hate them and you want nothing to do with them. But they can't do anything to you. You know, you you still, you know, you get all your rights protected and like I don't know. Yeah, Jordan had in his Twitter bio, you know, he's a clinical psychologist, and I'm I'm sure that he will, you know, continue. He'll probably put some, you know, uh, like renegade clinical or or something, right? Like uh, disgraced clinical psychologist or whatever he'll do. But he very much markets himself on the credential of being an expert, of being, you know, this this respected, not just a polemical pundit he's a psychologist and he's a good psychologist god damn it but but th- these gurus and jordan's not the only one they lean so heavily on their on academic their and professional professional con- credentials which are given by institutions but then describe those same institutions as being absolutely bereft of any kind of goodness or validity they're they're the most evil things in the world and that's a that's a paradox right that is a paradox (laughs) i i agree but it it's also that jordan wants those credentials but he doesn't want any of the usual restrictions that would come or you know that in regards to your conduct that might apply so like you said it is annoying if your institution or whatever you know tries to monitor your opinion on unrelated issues or whatnot. And various people could argue that the things that Jordan's been penalized for, they're not directly related to his like clinical practice. So what business is it of the institution? But they're kind of a symptom of the way that he's acting. And most psychiatrists or psychologists or whatever that become famous, like Dr. Phil or whatever, they do end up giving up their license because they don't want to abide by the restrictions of that discipline, right? And Peterson doesn't want to do any of the restrictions. And if you, Matt, if your, you know, vice chancellor or whatever was like complaining about your tweets, but then he went on Twitter and said, what a fucking pea brain, what a micro sold idiot he is, right? Somebody would say, well, hold on, Matt, like that's not professional behavior, even if you're right. You can't just insult all the other people in your institution constantly or that kind of thing, right? It's it's unprofessional. No, you can do it and you can face consequences for it and you can battle against them or that kind of thing. But it's very normal that there would be consequences yeah. for being like it's, unhinged in the way Jordan Peterson is. Like yeah, it's it's a very nuanced thing because I'm completely I completely agree, Chris, that Jordan Peterson and people like that are totally gaming the system and frankly deserve everything they get if they get anything. Jordan doesn't hasn't actually experienced any negative consequences yet. But at the same time, I'll just mention that, you know, in places like Australia, you do have academics who are fired 
for things like talking publicly about exam standards, for instance, saying saying mm-hmm. that we're sort of waving students through who are full fee paying and so on and, and challenging the university on that. So so there is, I think, genuine free speech issues. There's an issue there. Yeah. And yeah. it's just Jordan is on the wrong side of it. But I'm yeah. I'm, I'm not saying No, just yeah. to be clear, if I was the one like on the licensing body, I wouldn't penalize Jordan for the particular tweets that he got highlighted for. The one about the model on the Sports Illustrated and some joke where he, you know, he said that somebody should kill themselves on Twitter because it was obviously a sarcastic comment, right? It is akin to the fucking Twitter bot, you know, say, no, we detected that you said something positive about vaccines when you're being sarcastic or that kind of thing. So my argument isn't that in this specific case, all of the objections are completely valid, but it's more that those are symptoms of his unhinged conduct online. And it's why the licensing board has taken a mild disciplinary procedure. (laughs) And all that would have happened is that he would have took a course and he probably wouldn't have stopped and it would have happened again at some time, but like he can't handle that. So my argument is that Jordan's behavior is not befitting of like a responsible clinical psychologist. It's not. It's befitting of a right-wing polemical pundit. And that's what he is. Mm -hmm. And that's what he does. But he wants to lean on the, the credential of being a clinical psychologist. And he isn't a clinical psychologist anymore. He doesn't have a practice. He doesn't have any patients. And actually, he was previously penalized when he got famous for abandoning his patients. He mentions there that he was never in any trouble before he got famous. But when he got famous, his patients did complain that he was no longer available and wasn't treating them. And the licensing body agreed, right? And he got like a a little slap on the wrist then as well. So he's not a clinical psychologist with a practice anymore. He's never gonna be that again, but he just wants the credential and the credibility. And he, he, sh- he doesn't get everything he wants. He's a millionaire polemical pundit for the Daily Wire. That's his job now. So, you yeah. know, and he can he can still say he's basing it all on this psychological insights from his years of practice or whatever. But he, he the, the Ontario Clinician of S- Clinical Psychologists or whatever it's called, they don't have to be associated with his opinions, which is why they're taking this issue yeah. right like they they don't yeah. want to deal with we are signing off on his opinions because they clearly don't it's like it's a matter of having your cake and eating it too he's moved on he's much bigger and huger now like you said his full-time job is being a political polemicist it's not being a clinical psychologist a lot of what he does as a really hardcore political polemicist is inconsistent with that of being a nice, normal clinical psychologist. And, you know, that should be fine. You should understand that and and just move on. If I was on that board, I wouldn't have a concern with his political views or things like that specifically, right? It's just what I'd have a concern with is this, he's got given so many indications that he is not mentally well. That, that he's unbalanced, right? And that this sort of alternative universe that he's segued into clearly affects all aspects of his life. And yeah. I, I genuinely would seriously doubt his, uh, you know, like I wouldn't recommend a friend to be treated by Jordan Peterson. <laughs> like no. just like seriously, like you're going to, you're going to recommend someone who is unwell, is suffering from depression and insecurity and is unbalanced in all kinds of ways. Yes, go talk to Jordan Peterson. He's going to help you. No. So the unhinged tweets is, is an indication of a malaise. And I think, like, I don't know if these boards of, Um, These professional bodies have like a good procedure for sort of detecting that or like a way to sort of prove that or demonstrate that. And I'm sure their procedure they've got here is inadequate or whatever. But that's why I would say that he is on the wrong side of this. I'm sure they don't have procedures like designed to deal with one of your members becoming a global superstar and conspiratorial pundit, right? Like they don't. So they're, and you know, they're a little uh, regional licensing board for clinical psychologists in a particular region of that's of right Canada, so. they're not agents of goliath right <laughs> they're, they're well, not- oh shut up goliath Boom. Oh. the outcome of this is that anytime like that that board has or that organization has about three thousand followers on twitter 
And they tweeted out something, you know, like, happy Christmas, think about your mental health this Christmas. And the response to it (laughs) underneath was like, you Nazi scum, die in hell, like, you're, how dare you, we'll, it was just hundreds of quote retreats from Jordan Peterson fans, you know, the most unhinged, rabid things that you can imagine. And yeah, and that's, that's what the fan base that he's built, and that's what he's whipping up here it's so you know anyway so let's let's continue on because it gets worse but so here's him talking a little bit it's still on the consequences right but you'll hear him go back and forth in the kind of socratic dialogue with himself and like i said maybe i'm wrong and i should just shut the hell up and pack up and go home but my sense grandiose though it may be is that these bloody colleges regulatory boards they pose a major threat to the free speech and free thought of all Canadians, not just professionals. Canadians can think for themselves. What sort of professional consultation are you going to be able to obtain when the people you're talking to are terrified of telling you the truth? When you bring them your 13-year-old daughter who's in major distress, who's so concerned about her body that she's thinking about sterilizing herself and having her breasts removed, and your idiot goddamn psychologist isn't going to be able to do anything except lie to you that it's all right. How's that going to go for you? You think that through for like 15 seconds. And if you don't think that'll happen to someone in your family soon, you either don't have a family or you're deluded because it's coming your way real soon. But just there, he started saying, you know, maybe I'm wrong and I should just shut the hell up and go home and, you know, I might be thinking in grandiose terms. And by the end, he's saying, all of you, the, this is coming for your family you know, if you haven't experienced it now, you need to wake the hell up. You know, it, it, he works himself up into these like uh, demagogue tizzies. Mm. And it's just, it's, yeah, like even if he has kernels of points about things that, you know, he wants to argue about, he takes it up to like 11 mm. constantly. He can't just say, you know, well, should we be concerned if people have to, you know, think about how their clinical opinion is going to reflect on them politically? No, it's that everyone is going to be experiencing this soon in their immediate family. It's coming for you. Yeah. It's, you know, the WEF. Yeah. It's not about this provincial professional registration board getting complaints about unhinged tweets and then instigating this process to basically say, please stop making unhinged tweets. No, it's about them being instruments of this work orthodoxy that wants to take your daughters and, you know, make them chop their breasts off, chop their breasts yeah. off and so on. Like it's, yeah, it's up to 11 immediately and it's it's visceral and it's it's him being what he is now, which is this lunatic political extremist pundit you know laying the rhetoric on super thick and he demonstrates every time that that's not that's not the role of a clinical psychologist right it's 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 incompatible you can do one and you could argue that that's okay in a pluralistic society you're allowed to have you know unhinged radicals on and, and polemicists on on every side of the spectrum but then there's actual clinical psychologists like normal ones right his job is to treat people who are unwell and, you know, anyway. Well, so, you know, Matt, we, we kind of painted him as a bit of a melodramatic villain in some respects. So maybe that's unfair. So, you know, I feel that I have an obligation to fight this out in the public sphere. In many ways, it would be simpler for me just to tell them to go directly to hell and give up my license proudly, you know, and uh, not worry about this again. But... I don't know. I'm not there yet. Might happen. I'm not there yet. We'll play out this farce to its end. And I'll do that in the faith that if I conduct myself with a certain degree of honor and care, that the results won't be precisely what my would-be enemies intend. Let's put it that way. You get the raw emotion there you can hear his voice cracking mm. at some points right and but the interesting thing for me there Matt, again is you can hear the the kind of internal battle right because he's saying you know maybe it would be simpler for me to proudly just accept this and you know mm. move on but 
Yeah. But I'm not there yet. And not maybe there. it won't go the way they expect. And if I'm an honorable person, you know, what can they do? Mm. And at the end, it's like my enemies, it won't go the way they imagine. I won't go silently into the night. No. Right? So- well, well, Chris, you know, on our chronometer, we have this this grievance thing. And, uh, you know, this is essentially a grievance playing out in real time. And it's very similar to Brett that we heard earlier portraying himself along with a small group of brave others in the Rebel Alliance who have been cast out from the institutions, bearing that cross because they have to for the good of humanity. And that's the subtext here. It's only just barely below the surface, but let's call it a subtext. And I think it's really important. And it's important for guys like Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein to get those emotional hooks in because that's the thing that that inspires that immense loyalty and sympathy amongst the audience. Like here is a brave, principled man who is fighting a corrupt and evil system and he's doing it just because it's the right thing to do. You know, God, yeah. my God, you have to respect that, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yes, you you do. What a what a guy, you know. <laughs> That's it's amazing what he's willing to do. Now, Matt, here is uh another thing where we see a bunch of behaviors that are common in the guru sphere. I had to hold my tongue and bide my time while this legal action was proceeding. And now it's like it's very dangerous to put someone in a position where they don't have anything to lose. I don't have anything to lose. The worst they can do, and this is what they'll do, is they'll take my license and then I'll be known by those who wish to foster enmity against me as now disgraced Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson. But what that's going to do, I believe, is bring disgrace to those who levy that epithet. It'll just undermine the validity of the designation itself. It'll undermine public trust in the idea of psychologist, in the reliability of that designation. Now, you know, that's a pretty preposterous claim, but, and maybe I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, well, I'm willing to take the punches, but, but there's a reason that people bought 11 million copies of my book. The reason they bought 11 million copies of 12 Rules for Life was that they found it helpful, like psychologically helpful which was its purpose. There's a reason that the video interviews and lectures that I produced on YouTube and released on YouTube, mostly for free, not that I haven't benefited financially from all of this, because I certainly have, and I'm not the least bit ashamed of that. In fact, I'm pretty happy about it and grateful for it and hope it will continue. And I'm striving to make sure it does. It's like, There's a reason people are watching those videos and listening. So we'll see whose reputation suffers. Hopefully I won't do anything too stupid and angry along the way. And I don't think I will because I'm actually not particularly angry. It's like I digested all this a long time ago. I'm sad about it. I'm sad for my country. The one thing that that keeps striking me in this is, and I mentioned it previously, it's like Jordan has this thing where he sets up an opponent, you know, you might say, or and my critics would say, oh, Jordan, blah, blah, blah. And he usually does a funny voice and he, he makes a very bad, you know, straw man version of his argument and then explains why it's wrong. But the interesting thing here is that he seems to be kind of doing it, you know, with himself. Like he's, he was talking about that it'll undermine him being getting uh, reprimanded and losing the clinical psychologist label will damage the credibility for all clinical psychologists and all of psychology. And then he realizes how that sounds. He says, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong and maybe, you know, I, I just need to take the, the criticism. And, but then there's a, but, but actually, 11 million people have have read my books and you know they've <laughs> listened to my talk so he got this like weird split persona <laughs> thing going on yeah yeah this weird back and forth i got this nerdy thing as you know we often compare characters to people in star wars or lord of the rings or something like that and and i was thinking lord of the rings and y- your first thought would obviously be saruman right jordan peterson he's very gaunt he he looks like someone who would own a palantir. He's gazed too long into various orbs. That's the obvious yeah. choice. 
But I don't think so. It's it's Gollum, right? He's got it's Gollum. <laughs> he's got the voices. He's having the conversations with himself. There's the little reasonable one. Then there's the other voice, and then he. <laughs> It no. is stupid psychologists. <laughs> See my precious uh, credential, will they? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is like that. And also that thing of just constantly referencing how many people read his books, listen to his things, that that validates yeah. that, it, you know, that what do these pea brained micro souls know anyway? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> Gollum, Gollum, Jordan, <laughs> Jordan. Yeah. But, you know, he is speaking to a, like a very real power that these guys acknowledge that they have, right? That, that they are insanely popular in a way in which the Ontario Board of Psychologists is not. And, you know, you, you mentioned them making their little milk toast tweet about. I don't know, be sure to take care of your mental health these holidays or whatever. And they're just getting slammed by whatever. And like, that's the power that, uh, <laughs> not Saruman, Jordan Peterson um, <laughs> wields. <laughs> and, you know, he, he knows it and, he, and he's right. You know, he is more powerful than them in the field of public opinion. But he wants, he doesn't want them to take away his precious, the uh, <laughs> this little <laughs> registration thing. Yeah. You know, he's talked about the Pebrian Ontario Clinical Psychologist Board. Now, one other thing to contend with, Matt, is that the courts in Canada have consistently said that he's wrong. That, like, the, the board does have the right to impose... Uh, like training courses as penalties in response to complaints if it regards that as justified and um, that they are not infringing on his free speech more broadly by by doing so. So what about the courts? Do you do you think that you're going to continue this battle legally? Well, we do have one avenue. There is there is one appeal route left. We can appeal directly to the Supreme Court. Um, it's a very low probability uh, maneuver and, you know, another loss. Who knows, right? Because assume that gets rejected, which is the most likely outcome. Well, then those who are, are not very fond of me will say to those who want to believe, well, you know, three different levels of Canadian judiciary decided that Dr. Peterson was wrong. Who the hell is he to make claims that this is uh, what an inappropriate response. And look, I can understand why people would believe that. I would want to believe that, you know? Yeah, it so, means the entire, entire court system is compromised. Well, basically. it implies, it, it, it certainly implies that. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, he, he explained accurately the reaction to somebody be consistently being told they're wrong by all levels of the legal profession, right? That doesn't actually prove that you're you know, wrong, but it, it is a sign that you might be like at least legally incorrect in your interpretation. But Jordan is able to recognize that. But then immediately Michaela comes in with, well, that would mean that all Canadian legal system is completely corrupt, <laughs> wouldn't it? And, and Jordan's response isn't, well, you know, hold on. He's like, well, it certainly implies. <laughs> it, it cannot be that he could be wrong. Right, mm, he, mm. he cannot be in this instance. So, well, he's up against, and the gurus generally are up against all the institutions. Right, the anti-institutional thing on our gurometer is real, and it's not just the Ontario Board of Psychologists. It's not just what's his university, Waterloo, Calgary, Toronto. He was Toronto. In Toronto. I mean, he is an emeritus professor at Toronto still, mm. <laughs> despite reeling against yeah, them yeah. for for giving that to him. But yeah, uh, you'd think the work mob would have gotten around to removing that, but they they haven't. And also the entire legal system, and obviously all the politics, and like it's everything. All the institutions are hopelessly corrupt. So Michaela Peterson is just a few steps ahead of her dad there, I reckon. Yeah, Helen Lewis. She of course is you know at the vanguard of that charge against Jordan's persecution. But, <laughs> yes. So, you know, if all the institutions are corrupt, Matt, and we can't trust any of them, mm. what can we turn to? Is there anything? So whatever success I've had is because I say what I think. And obviously I paid a certain kind of price for that. I don't have a research career anymore. <laughs> 
Although that's not exactly true either, because I have some pretty damn good researchers on my staff and we're doing some remarkable things at a rate that mm -hmm. was like a hundred times faster than anything I could do in the university. Like, I don't think in some sense I haven't lost anything. Like I had to change. I'm not a full-time practicing professor anymore, although I'm still a professor emeritus, so I have that designation. I don't have a clinical practice, but I'm kind of practicing on a global stage. That's not an over, that's not an exaggeration. I don't have a university, but I'm building one. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so not, there's nothing in it that hasn't been gained apart from a certain amount of stress. But, you know, what, are you going to have a life without stress? Jordan, you know, I've lost my uh, university position. Have you, Jordan? <laughs> we have a bigger position now. We got a bigger audience. But, you know, I'm not really teaching anymore, but <laughs> are you not? You're teaching millions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see it playing out in his head. Like he's he's straddling both sides or both angles on it, which is on one hand, he's on the cross, right? He's been crucified. He's lost so much. And he's, he's lamenting. Wanting, he's lamenting the losses, but he's not unaware and is, is happy to admit to the tremendous successes at the same time time and yeah i don't know he seems a little bit confused about whether he wants to play the victim or the kind of all-powerful i laugh at your petty attempts to take <laughs> yeah, away yeah. my <laughs> it, it, it is like it is a split right like in, in the way that he presents it because he, he his tone of voice shifts to like kind of forlorn and you know i'm well i'm i'm not able to do research really anymore and i like research and but I, my team does research that's incredible. It's better than, you know, we do research better than any stupid Peterson, you know. So it's, a, it's it he, is, it's a very needs, Gollum. He needs, it's very Gollum. He needs to pick a lane. He needs to, he needs to decide whether it's been a, a good thing, all of, the, all of the wealth and the attention and the success in the public sphere or not. Uh, yeah. Well, so we're coming to the end, Matt, but there's, there's two things we have to play. One, because, you know, there's been a lot of this stuff, the conspiracy mongering, the anti-establishmentarianism, the narcissism. Uh, it's all digging the garometer, right? Mm -hmm. Proving the validity of that instrument. Yeah. One of the things that we have on the garometer is the Cassandra complex. Mm -hmm. It's a particular thing about, you know, uh, well, well, anyway, let's just, I, I just thought I'd mention it because, you know, I have, I have some of the abilities of Cassandra. Cassandra was a seer who was fated to be entirely accurate in her predictions. Her torture was that no one ever listened to her. So I don't have that problem because people do listen to me, but I do have some pro ability to see down the road to where things are going. I mean, I'm optimistic fundamentally. I certainly do believe that as a species, we're on the cusp of we, could, we are on the cusp of a potential prosperity and realm of possibility that's unparalleled in, that's unparalleled. Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. Don't make it this easy for us. Give us a challenge. Come on, we're smart guys. We can decode it from the, the, the subtext of what you say. You don't need to just tell us that you're literally Cassandra. Come on. It's not so hard. This was uh, a shot in the barrel. If all the gurus just run about saying, you know, I'm anti-establishment. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Cassandra. I'm profiteering like mad. That is kind yeah. of what you're doing. Is, <laughs> and, these are my, and these are my grievances. Um, yeah. yeah I'm I mean, mongering them. <laughs> they come very close to doing that sometimes, our superstars. They've dinged so many of our dimensions on the garometer this episode haven't they chris yeah and just to finish with i'll give a a clip which is a classic jordan peterson weaving in mythic symbolism and doing his sense making thing and tying it in these anti-establishment rhetoric all of it this is jordan uh being jordan just because the thing that's happening to you at the moment presents a problem doesn't mean it isn't rife with opportunity and i do think that's a reflection of the old dragon gold symbolism you know it's like you have to confront a dragon to get the gold. But what that also implies is that, well, it might look like a dragon, but maybe it's a treasure house. You know, and we're, t we're sort of taking that attitude with regards to Peterson Academy and also with Essay, the app that I'm working on with Julian. It's like, well, nobody teaches people how to write. Okay, well, if nobody's doing it, 
and you see that, well, then you could do it. The universities are disintegrating. Okay, well, hey, people still need to be educated. And that's a better way of looking at the world is just because it looks like, I don't know if there's any such thing as an opportunity that doesn't present itself as a problem. It's a great way of thinking about problems. You got your homespun wisdom about, you know, every problem is just an opportunity uh, waiting to be reframed in such a manner and reference to mythic symbolism. But is a dragon, is it really a dragon or a treasure house? You know, the proper sense maker style debates and setting up. <laughs> he's setting up a, an essay writing app. He's setting up mm. an alternative university. Yeah. They're, you know, they've got big things planned. The institutions are crumbling. Fortunately, gurus like Jordan are here to save the world. Yeah. Brett ha is contributing. Jordan is contributing. They're, we're going to be all right. Yeah. There's a good entrepreneurial spirit there. Um, think a lot of irons in the fire. He doesn't even need that little license. It's <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, these guys are doing very well. Thank you very much. They don't need a little license from the Ontario Board of Clinical Psychologists. Um, so, Chris, as a little bit of a wrap up, how about a whirlwind tour of just some of our gerometer dimensions? Galaxy brainness. We mm -hmm. saw this in spades with Brett, that really quite impressive way that he spans between evolutionary psychology, anti vax, and these various conspiratorial geopolitical theories about China and the United States. We saw anti-establishment stuff coming through. I did detect a note of that. Yeah. You did detect. Yeah. Do I need, I don't need to, re, I won't rehash it then. It was, it's pretty, it was pretty much there, but I think that grievance mongering thing was really validated in this episode because, you know, like you often think about it as being this kind of like retrospective thing. Like, oh, I've been, I've been badly done by, I was mistreated by these people back then. And they certainly do that. Yeah. Eric and Brett have yeah. their tales of, of, of abuse that they suffered at the hands of institutions. institutions. But this episode actually showed me how it actually plays a role in kind of how they cast themselves in what is transpiring now. Yeah. So, yeah. so they, are, they are bearing the cross. They are the ones who are standing up despite the fact that just the mere act of bravery in doing so is just going to have so many slings and arrows cast their way. I mean, that's that sort of Christ-like, you know, like you can see how that is, that is grievance, but sort of happening now, right? Yeah. Mistreatment, yeah. you know, unjust mistreatment that is happening to them right now as a result of their, their integrity, their bravery, and their intellectual abilities. Cassandra Complex, well, not much needs to be said there, does it? <laughs> Jordan <laughs> said it. Jordan said it. Uh, we'll, we'll leave that there. Conspiracies. They were there, mainly from Brett this time. And the pseudo-profound bullshit too, both of them are very good at it. Um, we talked about with Brett how he really does have a talent, same as his brother, in talking at an Alex Jones level degree of insanity, but doing it in a tone of voice, in a calm, reflective, professorial, fatherly kind of fireside chat tone, almost regretful that, that one has to speak up like this, referencing scientific technical jargon, certainly works on Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson said, you know, could you just explain that, you know, just in, in less technical terms for, in for, 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 in layman yeah. terms for us. I mean, when in actual fact, he's just, like he said, he's just picking up random buzzwords from the anti-vax discourse. And of course, Jordan, with his lovely allegories and analogies and metaphors, um, classic Jordan style. I think that's it for me. I just see this as a total validation of the Gromita. I'm glad we managed to work Lord of the Rings in there. The ones you didn't mention, but I'll just name them because I think people can do their own <laughs> matching up is self-aggrandizement and narcissism again i did detect a note of that in the content for both of them encouraging cultish dynamics like say for example talking about the dream team leading the good people against the forces of evil or <laughs> the corrupt institutions needing to be you know fought against by led by brave psychologist heroes and revolutionary theories developing your own novel insights into how the world functions that are, you know, if people would just take these ideas that you had seriously, Brett admittedly did that more, but I mean, Jordan 
as is about to revolutionize the field of academia with his new university. So you've got that and profiteering, <laughs> Jordan, again, I think, illustrating that very well with all of the money-making schemes he has, which are set up to replace the establishments. None of these apps are free. None of, none of, it is not free to enroll in this university. There uh, might be a free trial. So, <laughs> yeah, it just, they all thing up. And, you know, Jordan and Brett do it in their own unique style. But it's so many of those things reoccur. And frankly, they've gotten worse. <laughs> that's that's the thing that I think people need to know. They were never good, never particularly good. But like Jordan Peterson has become a version of Gollum, a, a like political right wing Gollum character. And Brett Weinstein is more overtly unhinged conspiracy theorist yeah. in the vein of Alex Jones. Yeah. So, yep. They have gotten worse. It is a weird thing that happens with us where when we cover people, and I remember, I know that when we cover people like Elon Musk, for instance, I don't know much about them. I have relatively ambivalent opinions about them. I do some research ap- about them and I go, mm, that they, they actually don't seem that good. We do a, you know, a generally negative kind of coverage, but then they always become so much worse subsequently. It's like the guru's pod kiss of death. I know. Yeah. I, I feel with Elon Musk, we didn't, we didn't really, I mean, we caught him well into the spiral, but it, like everyone. That we, almost everyone that we've covered has spiraled further. There are people that we've covered that haven't, but in general, they scored low at the start. You yeah. know, they weren't exhibiting that many concerning qualities. So there you have it. It's definitely not a mini decoding, uh, but it it is uh, checking in on old friends. And sadly, I'll just close the door and silently back away from <laughs> that room with the old friends and, uh, and leave them there for now. I'm sure they'll be back soon enough, but um, Hmm. we'll be back too. We have Sean Carroll to look at and we've got other things. Yeah, we uh, we actually actually have some good guests, like interesting, intelligent, nice, normal, not mentally unbalanced guests. So, you know, um, there's balance in the force. That's right. That's right. Well, it's been a pleasure, Matt. Um, So I'll... You know, I'll I'll bid you adieu. Mm. Will I? Will I bid you adieu? Should you say that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Good night, sweet prince. Goodbye. <laughs>